morning, everyone. Good, good afternoon, Aida. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for accepting this invitation from Ricardo. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we will now have the talk from Aida. It's uh, the, the title of the talk is A Look into Physical Modeling and Design for Carbon Nanotube Based Circuits. Uh, Aida received PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is currently a research director for French National Council of Scientific Research, NRS, attached to the Laboratoire d'Informatique, de Robotique et de Microelectronique de Montpellier. Previously, she had positions at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Mentor Graphics, Cadence Design Systems, STM Microelectronics, and IBM. She has received several awards and serves, serves as technical program committee member for several conferences and is uh, associate editor for IEEE Transactions on VLSI, Journal of Microelectronics Reliability, and Microelectronic Journal. And her research interest focuses on nanometer scale issues in high performance VLSI design with emphasis on power, thermal, sino integrity and reliability issues, as well as, as well as on circuits and systems for emerging technologies and nanomaterials. So thanks again, Aida, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and again for having me here on the IEEE CAS Young Professionals Workshop. So I hope you can hear me fine. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes, I am Aida Todri Sanyal, and I'm a director of research in the microelectronics department at LIRM. And I thought first uh, to start this talk with giving a little bit for those of you, for students maybe that are not familiar about our research um, environment here at, in France. So, I'm affiliated with uh, CNRS, as um, just was as introduced. And also with the University of Montpellier, which we are in the south, so in the south region in France. Um, we have a, a very dynamic university and a research environment here. And uh, LIRM, which is uh, with two tutels from university and also CNRS, has a, a very dynamic in terms of different departments, so in computer science, robotics and microelectronics, where I'm part of. And if any of the students that might find some of our research interesting, we always welcome students from Brazil to establish collaborations, but also to have exchange during their PhDs or postdoc programs. So with that, I thought to kind of introduce who we are and a few words as well about our research at the mainly in the microelectronics department, we look into various research efforts into future computing. So we look at it from the device aspects which I'll also cover a little bit in this talk. So what are some of the new devices and architectures enabling Moore's law? Uh, a lot was said from Pascal with respect to the new design space exploration. So going in 3D integration, monolithic integration for more energy efficient design. And also how we are going beyond the new and computing, which has been some of the recent topics we are targeting in our department especially in the neuromorphic computing and also in quantum computing. So for large scale problems that are currently intractable in classical computing and how co quantum computing can be a problem solver for some of these problems. Um, in my team, so in my group, to kind of set the stage, our efforts are a lot into energy efficient nanoelectronics. So lo we're looking at it from physical design, so from devices, circuits, all the way to architecture. And the main driving of this is to have an understanding on the material properties and looking into new materials such as 1D and 2D materials, so graphene, carbon nanotube, MOS2, or transition metal decalganized, where understanding the physical properties, the idea is to explore them and investigate through various atomistic to device level modeling what would be the added value if these new materials were to be used for field effect transistors, such as the channel material. 
And we are looking into, as I'll talk a little bit about, the carbon nanotube-based devices in this talk. Another effort is to look at these new materials for interconnect applications, so for front end that will be on the devices, so to understand their channel properties on the back end of line on the interconnects is to see how these new materials can address some of the challenges that we are currently facing on the back end of line. And I'll talk a lot about devices that interconnect based on carbon nanotubes and how that can lead us to carbon nanotube circuits. Another aspect that we are covering is also into the memories, also into memory stirs based on these new materials and also how our energy efficient they are in order to be able to build neuromorphic based systems. And 3D integration is, as was uh, talked on the, uh, by Pascal on the previous uh, presentation, we are also looking into the physical design. So what is the trade off between power uh, consumption and performance? as we are leveraging 3D integration or monolithic integration and also looking, looking into the design style. So how is the power delivery or clock delivery will be performed given that there are many constraints coming from 3D integration. So this is the focus that I'm covering in my team with my students, but in this talk, I'll mainly covering the devices and interconnects based on carbon nanotubes. So the outline of this talk, as I mentioned first, I'll start a little bit into the interconnects, also uh, covering the aspect of how we, we design them. So what are some of the fabrication methods that we have put forward and what are the type of electrical characterization we obtain? Also followed by atomistic simulations, so a lot into the physical modeling, understanding as well uh, the properties, the physical properties of the carbon nanotubes and then going uh, a lot into the design technology aspect and comparing as well, what is the added value in terms of the energy delay product with FinFET, so the current state of the art CMOS technology and back end of line with copper interconnects and also some perspectives in this work. I want to start first maybe by saying that there are uh, in this uh, quest of energy efficiency, there are many layers or levels that we can look into how we can obtain this edit or so very much needed energy efficiency gain. There are various aspects that this problem can be looked at. First is how we actually compute. So what is the state variable? So the conventional scale CMOS, we've been talking about the electrical charge. So the charge needed to charge and discharge a capacitance. So this is how we compute also the power, uh, the power consumption. But that has been the main um, the main state variable that have been used for scale CMOS technologies. I want to mention that there are other in the in the current uh, in the community. There is a lot of efforts to look also beyond the the charge, the electric charge, so to look into the spin, into the phase, in strongly correlated electron state or molecular state type of variables, and this will lead to a new paradigm of how we compute. From the material points of view, so. There is on the CMOS, we, we work a lot into the silicon as a substrate. However, there are other new materials such as carbon, which is the focus of this workshop as well, to look into what is the also the physical properties of these new materials and how they can address some of the challenges that we are seeing from both the device and interconnects. So I'll talk a little bit about the carbon and that would be the main focus. But there are other materials such as nanostructure, nanocomposites, uh, transition metal decalganides as well. From the device, so there is a lot of effort from the last 50, 60 years in the community on the CMOS, scaling the CMOS, and which has also been sort of the, the self-fulfilling prophecy with the Moore's law. But there is also other new type of devices, such as spintronics, quantum devices, ferromagnetic field effect transistors, molecular type of devices, and also single um, electron transistors. And all of them, uh, have their own um, uh, steep slopes, but also they're interesting from the energy efficiency. So they are compact, but also they provide uh, an important uh, gain in terms of energy efficiency. From the data representation, we talk a lot about, so also the focus of this work and this workshop is to talk about the digital type of uh, circuits and benchmarks, but other type of representation, which also matters in terms of where is the energy or power consumption going if there was an analog design or a quantum or a pattern-based data representation. 
From the architecture, a lot of gain can also be uh, obtained if we were to also think about how the system is designed. So um, from the Venumen approach, we have the processor, the processing and the memory blocks, so two separate, which are communicating via a data bus, and that has been uh, the major bottleneck in terms of performance and power consumption. We are seeing now that we are leading a lot into the analog architectures, analog-based computing, more and more things of so brain-inspired computing, quantum computing, and so into these new paradigms. And it is important to say that the energy efficiency can be gained at all these different levels. So from state variables, materials, devices, how we represent the data and also the architectures. And I will try to uh, cover, so compare with the current state of the art on scale CMOS so with what I have highlighted here in these blocks, but based on the carbon nanotube circuits and how we can have this additional gain in energy efficiency using new materials. I also thought to start a little bit about where we, you know, a little bit this historical perspective of so where we have been as a community a research in, in academia and also in industry. So we started about six, 70 years ago now uh, with a very first integrated circuit, about two transistors in centimeter square type of area. And by 71, the major milestone was from Intel's first microprocessor, about 2,300 transistors. And more lately, so just last year, we had a very uh, a billion, so reaching up to 12.2 billion transistors embedded on a single processor. So from IBM, so this is Z15, their processor, reaching frequencies 2.6 gigahertz and uh, enabled or implemented in 40 nanometer FinFET and five nanometer SRAM. So this is a huge um, sort of a roadmap in terms of where we started and where we are in the last 60, 70 years in the semiconducting um, industry. Also important to mention that um, there have been some trade-offs over the years, especially by 2013, we reached this plateau uh, where we can see that the clock frequencies sort of set, uh, started to level, so to, to reach a plateau, and not to, to go into higher frequency ranges. And that was the main trigger for that was the trade-off between the power consumption and the heat built up. So in order to enable more uh, uh, implementation of transistors embedded on a single or in a system on chip, um, the clock frequencies had to be limited because of the uh, very large considerate thermal buildup and very large power consumption, so which became sort of the limiting factor. And where we are headed, and also what was the previous talk covered about was the 3D integration, which will give sort of a room more, more. So it gives a room another degree of flexibility and freedom to be able to integrate many IPs so from accelerators, image sensors, 3D processors, and an active interposer to have this um, heterogeneous system to provide, as, uh, to address some of the current challenges as we are seeing for cy cyber physical systems or for enabling artificial intelligence at the edge. So we'll see more and more 3D integration playing a role to be able to address or to provide a solution for this various or multiple functionality um, pro blocks that we need to deploy on cyber physical systems. Another um, uh, important um, there's um, another important progress that is going on on um, computing, on the future of computing, is that we are now looking into energy efficient paradigms, such brain inspired computing, such as neuromorphic computing, in order to address or to go beyond the von Neumann type of architecture to address these very much needed low power solutions for embedded systems. And another also sort of um, uh, complement or uh, another beyond von Neumann and neuromorphic computing is quantum computing, where we really are trying to exploit the physical um, uh, quantum mechanics principles to be able to build quantum machines that can solve currently intractable problems with classical computing. So this is sort of another paradigm that we are headed. So it is a very interesting um, overview to where we started. So from the very first transistors to systems on chips with billions of transistors, 3D integration for heterogeneity and functionality, and to more low power sol solutions such as neuromorphic and quantum systems. 
And I would like to start with the devices and also describe a little bit more where carbon nanotube devices play a role, so enabling Moore's law. The current state of the art on device architectures, we are with using pin fets at 10 up to 7 nanometer nodes where we have, as you can see here, this, um, this device architecture, so with pin fets, and as we are going further into the, into the scaling, there is nano sheets, so 5 nanometer to 3 nanometer, and beyond that, there is device, novel device architectures labeled as fork sheets, as you can see here, and this is a roadmap by iMac where we are seeing that not only to be able to have a very good electrostatic control of the gate, we need to rethink as well how we are controlling the gate. So that's why nano sheets and fork sheets seem to be the proposed solution as we are going forward. Uh, not only the device architecture is evolving as we are pushing further with scaling, but we'll see that we are also looking into new materials. This is again a roadmap from iMac where germanium-based fins are a potential solution as we go to the two nanometer node. Another potential solution, which is the most viable solution uh, in terms of these uh, new devices, is complementary field effect, so the FIFETs. The idea here is that you have an NMOS on one side and the PMOS on top, so a complementary device such as this, in order to be able to further scale and to continue on to two nanometer and how this will be the, the basic building block. And these type of devices will also be enabled by the buried power layer, so the new sort of innovation as well in terms of how the middle of line and the front end is also being processed. And if you are a little bit curious or interested about this, you can also look into the European flagship programs and the European Excel programs in terms of the current ongoing development from the process uh, manufacturing and also from the uh, library design development for two nanometer nodes. So this is the new program, Nano 2022, and also the Excel joint undertaking programs. And the focus, uh, as I mentioned, is toward these complementary FETs, but also looking into new materials, so germanium-based uh, fins and nano sheets. Now, this is where carbon nanotubes can also be sort of the what's beyond this uh, further scaling. As we reach the two nanometer, we reached about a certain, uh, a very limited number of electrons that can flow on the channel. So what is beyond these devices? And carbon nanotubes are a viable uh, potential devices to, to further explore for building large integrated systems. And that is because of their very much interesting properties in terms of their mobilities, in terms of their ballistic transport. And here are some SEM images from IBM. And you can see here that the carbon nanotubes are used as the channel material between source and drain. And you can also see here how a single wall carbon nanotube has been contacted and you can see the top gate with titanium gold and the source and drain with palladium uh, gold uh, type of electrodes to build this um, uh, very regular but also very design friendly for building large scale systems. And there was a milestone from the uh, Stanford group and also from MIT group to build the very first processor based on carbon nanotube transistors even though they are using copper as back end of line, but this was the very first proof of concept and also um, uh, to show the potential and also the improvement in the power consumption of building such system. And if you are interested to look a little bit more on this, there are, I, I have put throughout several references but that you can find out for further uh, information. I would also like to um, say a few words here because it's important as we are exploring novel devices, so novel channel material. Um, even though the workshop is on carbon nanotubes, I would like to say that there are also 2D materials. These 2D materials such as mono or multi-layer here, so you might have heard of graphene, uh, but also there are other 2D materials such as MOS2 as shown here, which are a very good um, candidates for the channel material for field effect transistors. 
So they have also very interesting physical properties, optoelectronic and also mechanical properties, which make them a very suitable candidate for the channel in field effect. And also they have very specific band gaps, which can be tuned. So they make some very interesting for nanoelectronics. And uh, a first microprocessor, even though very simple, proof of concept has been shown from colleagues and published in Nature, where these are sort of the new paths or the new directions that people are exploring what is beyond CMOS and beyond the two nanometer node. And the work here, so in the workshop, I'll continue on to elaborate further on carbon nanotube devices, but I thought it was important for you guys to know also what is, are the new materials that the community in, we are exploring with respect to field effect and the channel material. I also like to mention that in the group, we are using these carbon nanotube devices. So um, not only as field effect for nanoelectronics, but also recently we have started to look at them for biosensing and sort of strain sensors, also as uh, biosensors because the, the channel, so the carbon nanotube based channel or the MOS2 based channel is very sensitive. Uh, due to strain, due to uh, some pressure, but also due to the presence of analytes. So this is also an alternative use application of these type of devices. And we are exploring them in the current framework of a European project labeled Smart Vista. So if you are curious and you want to know more about it, I would like to direct you to the website so you can see a little bit what are the current uh, developments that we have done with carbon nanotube field effect transistors and 2D uh, MOS2 based transistors. So that was on the devices and now focusing a little bit on the interconnects and also what are the challenges with the current state of the art. I'd like to start by depicting them first here. So as you probably can uh, see them, uh, we have here the devices. So this is a cross-sectional of a, a processing um, device, a, a processing chip. So you can see here the devices. So in the very front end, and um, here you have all the interconnects. So the uh, intermediate global interconnect all the way to the chip bumps. And what is important to note here is that even though with devices, we have started to scale and we have more energy efficient devices, the bottleneck now is the context. So uh, immediately how we actually deposit these contacts on top of the gates or source and drain on the devices. So the middle of line, intercon intermediate interconnects and global interconnects. The reason is that they occupy a lot of space on the chip. So there is a lot of congestion that they also can uh, impose. And there is a lot of parasitics associated with them as well. So not only the impact performance, but also the impact also power. And they have been sort of the overlooked um, candidate in terms of where is the power consumption um, uh, going. And th for that reason, there has to be also a new thinking or a new look into how these interconnects are actually implemented and what are the suitable materials to replace or to go beyond copper. Uh, I would like to also mention here what are the challenges on the current state of the art copper interconnect. So with scaling, so first we started with copper, which is the metal uh, that fields the core of the interconnect trenches. So here we have copper, we have a liner and a barrier. And what is going on with scaling? We see that there is less and less room for the core metal to be filled. So there is the liner and the barrier did not scale while only the core metal did scale. So now the parasitics, the liner and the barrier are dominating and there is not any more enough room to be able to fill or to have um, an interconnect resistance that is lower, even though we are scaling, but the interconnect resistances are going up. So two solutions that are being explored in the industry and also in academia is to look, can we have an alternative barrier? That means we replace it, so a more low resistive barrier. And some um, uh, groups have been looking into two dimer materials such as graphene as an alternative barrier because it's very thin, it's atomic thin, and it also has very suitable physical properties to act as a barrier. 
The other ones could be no barriers at all. That means we are looking into to filling, not necessarily with copper, but with another material. So uh, we'll see in a few moments what are the alternative materials to be able to fill to replace copper. So it provides this low resistivity as we scale. So the two challenges that co is coming up with um, copper from, we have two, from the reliability perspective, we have the electromigration phenomena that is happening. So what is happening with the, with the copper, so as you can see here, and here you have the liner and the barriers, there are voids or HELOCs that will occur after long periods of time, so during the lifetime of the chip, because the current is unidirectionally flowing on these metal segments, and high amount of current, so high current density flowing for low periods of time, you will make atoms to actually move, to dislocate, and they would create these gaps or these voids here. And what would this mean that the, you have now potentially to create these holes, so opens and shores even defects and even increase the resistance. So these are the electromigration issues that appear during the lifetime of the, of the chip. And the other, issue which is more on the performance side is as we are scaling with the interconnect scaling so what we are seeing in copper we are seeing two things the grain boundaries are becoming very dominant so the resistance due to the grain boundaries you can see here the grain boundaries on this cross-sectional part here and also we have the sidewall scattering so these two phenomena as we scale, the grain boundaries are becoming more dominant. So we see this uh, scattering effect because the electrons, rather than going ballistically, so they're rather than going straight forward, they are bouncing back and forth, so are creating this higher resistance. And, and we see this especially in the exponential trend in the very uh, scaled, so in nanometer regime scaling. So these two, uh, reliability and the performance, are becoming critical uh, issues as we are scaling with copper. So that's why there is a lot of effort to see what could be the potential replacement. Uh, and maybe there are several solutions, so combinations of materials. So looking into the roadmap of the devices, as you can see here, I thought to bring in this report from uh, the ITRS as well, from ITRS 2.0, is to see here all this um, red sort of um, parts on the report where it mentions that there is not enough room to be able to put a contacts on top uh, on top of the gates or in top also so the context is there is not enough room to actually perform the the context and the middle of line so to to contact to source and drain so there is even though the devices are scaling so even though we are we are looking into noble architecture so gate all around nano sheets fork sheets that we are having a problem with respect to the contacts on these devices. So for that reason, some of the ongoing exploration, and also you will see that they will become uh, into the next node uh, processing, is to go beyond copper and tungsten and to look into alternative materials. So some of the alternative materials are cobalt and ruthenium. So cobalt for is um, will be uh, developed for 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer nodes, while ruthenium for 5 nanometer and more compound type of materials for 2 nanometers and, and beyond. Why is that? Is because we are trying to limit the resistivity. So what are the parasitics associated with this material? So you can see here with copper, with 2 nanometer barriers, so we can obtain a much better performance with ruthenium as we are going down into the into the scaling. And you can even see here some TEM images from IDM of last year where there are several um, several companies, industry looking into having cobalt for middle of line and also ruthenium for the middle of line as we are going further into the scaling. But that also brings me to carbon nanotubes. So what is beyond? So what is the outlook or the perspective on middle of, on middle of line, but also back end of line interconnects as we continue on scaling? And can we think of a system that is based on carbon nanotube devices, but also carbon nanotube based interconnects? And 
a little bit of um, just a little bit of background on carbon nanotubes. So they are rolled up graphene sheets, and depending on the angle that they are rotated, so the chirality or the angle of rotation, you can obtain zigzag carbon nanotubes or armchair carbon nanotubes. And that is also this notation here. So zigzag and zero and armchair and n. So this shows the angle that they were rotated in order to be able to obtain a carbon nanotube uh, like in this form or in that form. Similarly, carbon nanotubes can be a single wall as represented here or multi-wall where you have many tubes uh, which have been laid, um, stacked into one another. So this is the multi-wall. And another property, interesting property of carbon nanotubes is they can be either metallic or semiconducting. You can see here, so for example, there is this is a metallic because you can see that there is no band gap. And here as well, you can see that there is uh, an opening. So there is a more semiconducting property. So this is an interesting property for carbon nanotubes that makes them suitable for both a device, so a semiconducting uh, carbon nanotube as the channel material, but also metallic as the material for carbon nanotube back and offline, so the interconnect material. And let me say also a few words with respect to the carbon nanotube growth. So um, there are a lot of um, ongoing efforts and over the last decade, there have been a lot of um, research on the lab with respect to how to grow high quality carbon nanotubes. And we have explored the growth of carbon nanotube CVD, so uh, chemical vapor deposition, where we create first these trenches on the silicon, so via hole, and then there is a conformal uh, coating with um, uh, aluminum oxide so in order to have this uniform coating over the trench. And then as a catalyst, iron is used. And you can see here that this is at the beginning. So this is how the growth of the carbon nanotubes will be enabled using a high filament CVD growth. And this allows us to grow carbon nanotubes with a very well controlled diameter. An important thing to say here that this is done um, uh, with collaboration with colleagues from uh, H2020 Connect project, so various colleagues at European level collaboration. And also another important factor is that to grow high quality carbon nanotubes, you need very high temperatures, 900 Celsius up to 1100 Celsius. And here, in order to make the process of CVD growth of carbon nanotubes that is TMOS friendly, we had to use low temperatures, around 450 C. So we can see what would be the quality of the carbon nanotubes at this temperature if they were to be CMOS process friendly. And here shows a few time images about the type of or the growth quality of the carbon nanotubes that we're able to obtain. So here you can see, for example, that we have mainly multi-wall CNT growth. And this is the statistics of the type of carbon nanotubes. So this shows the number of shells. So we have mainly uh, diameter seven to eight nanometer in diameter and with three to five shells. So these are multi-wall carbon nanotubes that we can grow and um, with several shells in it. And another important factor, which I will in, um, try to mention here to bring to your attention is also the context. So how do we contact carbon nanotubes? And also this is an important um, issue because in order to be able to build systems, so if you want to build uh, a device and then if you want to build uh, a logic gate to, to lead to circuits, you need to, we need to understand what are the best way to contact carbon nanotubes? So we explored two types, the side contact. So this is around the carbon nanotube, so side, and the edge or the end contact. That means this is connecting to the edge of the carbon nanotube. So here shows the two TEM images with respect to individual multi-wall CNT with palladium gold contact as a side contact. And here is an open-ended, you can see here an open-ended multi-wall CNT and the end contact, which is on the side of the, of the carbon nanotube itself. Another thing that we also uh, explored is 
can we dope? Uh, so can we actually uh, do charge transfer? So can we actually do doping on carbon nanotubes? And one way that we did this is as we are about to put, so when we are putting the contacts, before we put the contacts of palladium and gold as shown here on the right hand side, we actually put this dopant, so these red circles here to show that uh, there are dopants that are being sprayed in into the carbon nanotube, so this is platinum salt, in order to be able to improve some physical properties of the carbon nanotube. Now, why is that? As I mentioned, if we want to have high quality carbon nanotubes, we need to grow them at very high temperature. But because we are growing them at around 450, which is not very high, and so there's a lot of defects on the carbon nanotubes, and I'll mention them in a little bit, we thought we explored dop doping as a potential way to improve further the resistivity, so the conductivity of carbon nanotubes, and also its variability. So here in this uh, images here, so there are some stem images to show the type of carbon nanotubes and also when it was doped. You can see here, for example, from the stem and EDX dark field images, the concentration of carbon, platinum, and chloride. And also here on the electron energy loss electroscopy uh, uh, spectroscopy, you can see also the concentration of each of these different elements. And what we notice that inside the CNT, the, um, the face of the platinum salt, it's an amorphous state. Now, the question you would be posing is, okay, so this is on the process and this is also on the growth uh, techniques. What does it mean in terms of the electrical performance? So we performed electrical characterization for various CNT lengths as shown in this graph here on the left for individual multi-wall CNTs. And what we see is these red uh, boxes, these little dots show here, is that we have a very large variability. So from 55 kilo ohm per micron up to 235 kilo ohms per micron. So this is a very large range of resistance that we obtain from our devices, from our uh, multi-wall CNTs. Of course, this is a function of the CNT length, but also as a function as well of the uh, contacts. On bundles, you can see here as well this resistance versus a CNT line length. So it is a much more controlled. So there is a less variability on the bundles than with respect to an individual CNT. And the two conclusions we came up from the electrical characterization is that there is a very large variability on the CNT lines, and this is due to the chirality. So as you, you remember, chirality was the rotation of the carbon nanotube, which defines if it's a metallic or a semiconducting. So that means we have a mixture of CNTs. And also due to the low power CVD growth, we have a lot of variability as well on the CNT conductivity by itself, but also due to the contact resistance as well. So, and in order to control this, this is what doping was of interest for us. So to look into what would be the advantage or the impact of doping on the conductivity of the CNTs, we see that with doping, we were able to narrow a little bit this variability, as it's shown here on the right hand side, you can see the, res the resistance, so the linear resistance before and after doping. We were able to, to reduce a little bit this variability and also to improve the conductivity by two times. So doping was one mitigation technique for us to be able to mitigate the, the problems due to the low power or to the low temperature CVD growth of carbon nanotubes. So for that reason, uh, we will see also how we use doping into the circuit design and benchmarking. Here is a little bit of um, state of the art with respect to carbon nanotubes and carbon nanotube resistivity to various works available in literature. So there are, we divided them with respect to if it's a bundle of CNT, so there is like a forest, like a, a lot of the CNTs, or if they are individual CNTs. And you can see here that what we notice that if we are going for CNT line length, for example, like in local interconnects where 
the lines are in nanometer range, we see that individual CNTs, so the resistance, the resistivity from individual CNTs is more suitable. So if we were to have uh, to exploit them meaningfully, you would mean that for low line lengths, so for uh, shorter line lengths, individual CNTs would be more suitable. But for longer lengths, we can see that doping could be a suitable option because we are we are reducing the resistivity, we are becoming almost competitive to what we have with copper, so about 1000 microns per centimeter. So now our goal into our benchmarking and also into our circuits um, simulation is to explore the potential of doped individual multi-wall CNTs for local interconnects. So I'll continue a little bit more now on this design technology co-optimization. So using CNT FETs with CNT interconnects versus the fin FETs. So what we have from the state of the art with copper interconnects and FinFET devices, and to understand what is the added value of uh, such technology. So I would like to first mention that uh, we uh, developed two different types of benchmarks. So we developed the 17 stage ring oscillator, a very straightforward ring oscillator, but we developed it with two dif uh, different technologies. So the first one was on carbon nanotube technology, so using carbon nanotube FETs, so field effect transistors, and also multi-wall CNT lines as the interconnect material. We also used, as I, as I explored uh, earlier, the doping version of these multi-wall CNTs to see if they further can improve performance and power. And we compared this carbon nanotube benchmark a ring oscillator with another 7 nanometer CMOS node benchmark, where we are using trigate fin fed devices and copper as back end of line material. So the goal now is using the same benchmark, but with two different flavors. So one with fin fed, so the 7 nanometer, um, so you can look at it into here, into the bottom, you can see here in the schematic, so we are having two type of uh, design. We also, in, in a little bit more detail here, you can see how the physical design of the CNT benchmark would look like. So for example, here you can see that we have the carbon nanotubes to be all over, so from power to ground. So you can see here how the first NMOS and PMOS um, C -FET, CNT FETs and also how they are connected. So in a little bit about how the layout, if we a representation, this even though this is somewhat of a sketch or an illustration of the layout, but to show you where the carbon nanotubes have been used to replace uh, the copper back end of line interconnect. So our goal here is to explore the carbon nanotube wear design rules. So what it means in terms of how we were to, what would be the suitable CNT diameters? What would be the suitable CNT spacing? So a little bit the physical design rules, similarly as we do on CMOS with copper and with interconnects physical design rules, to be able to understand the spacing, the CNT length, the context, the chirality and the doping, if we were to have to apply this in a benchmark and to have a comparison with the CMOS, 7 nanometer CMOS node. So I would like to say a few words on first with the carbon nanotube field effect. So we are using a very well known and a very applicable um, and a well accepted model, virtual source model from the community. This was developed from the Stanford group. So if you are interested to look a little bit more, I would point you to their papers, which are listed here in the bottom. And also their code is available on the NanoHub. So this is the representation of the carbon nanofield, uh, carbon nanofield effect transistor, where this is the IV curve, as you can see here, and the device parameters as listed. The ones that we are most interested in our work is to see the width and the spacing between the CNTs. And the CNT diameter that we use for this work, as you can see here, is listed as 1.2 nanometers. So these are the type of carbon nanotube um, uh, single wall CNT uh, uh, lines that we are using inside the for the channel. And also we are considering now what would be if the gate width 
would be different, what would be also the respective characteristics of this device. So for that reason, we are looking into the device parameters such as the width and the spacing. On the multi-wall CNT interconnects, so in my group, we developed a similarly in NanoHub the model. So you can also, if there are students out there interested to explore this, I would encourage you to look into the NanoHub, the references here on the bottom, where you can actually start to, ply, to, to, um, to plug this in and play with it. And the model is based on the several assumptions. You can have the flexibility to use a side contact or an end contact, as illustrated here. Also, you have the possibility to have various chiralities. So as I mentioned, armchair or zigzag in order to be able to represent as closely as possible to what we achieve from the CNT growth, so metallic or semiconducting. Similarly, so here on this part, so if you look into the model, so you have multiple layers multiple branches of your from inner shell all the way to the outer shell and this represent if this the carbon nanotube was multi-wall however even a single wall can be represented by simply having a single branch another possibility is as well to include the impact of defects so you can see here there is an r def so that means if there are defects because of the low temperature growth of the carbon nanotube that can be included. So in a nutshell, what we have included is the chirality, so metallic or semiconducting, the contacts, side or end, the defects, because there might be defects due to growth, like monovacancies, devacancies, and the doping effect, because the doping, as I mentioned, can be as a very good knob or an alleviation technique to improve the conductivity of carbon nanotubes. And all of these are available on NanoHub, and also we have published several publications on this, and I would encourage you to look into it, and if there are any questions, please come to us as well. Now, I would like to give you a little bit of a physical understanding what happens with doping, so why doping is so interesting. So here we have the, the doping for impact on metallic carbon nanotubes and in semiconducting, so in blue, is showing the number of conducting channels with the Fermi level shift. And in the red graph, it's the number of conducting channels with the Fermi shift. The Fermi shift is represented as the doping impact because when doping is applied, there is a charge transfer and that changes your Fermi level shift. So there, that's why there is a shift. And when the Fermi shifts, you can see here on the red, for example, in semiconducting, the number of conducting channels also increases with it. So what is happening if in a very uh, simplistic way to represent is that semiconducting shells are behaving like metallic with doping. So this is how the conductivity is improved. You can also see it in this, gra in this graph on the very right hand side, where you can see that the metallic um, and also the semiconducting carbon nanotubes, they start behaving. So the number of their conducting channels, so the number of paths for electrons to flow is increasing with doping. And this is an important characteristic that we are exploring in as a knob, as I mentioned, to improve the carbon nanotube properties. Now, in terms of the end contact, this also has an importance because we are seeing that doping appears to make a significant contribution to reducing the contact resistance. So here, for example, you have hydrogen layer at the interface. Here you have oxygen layer. And here you have oxygen layer, but also with the doped carbon nanotubes. And as shows here in this graph, we can see that doping and the oxygen layer interface makes the resistivity of the contact goes down. So this is an interesting also feature in order to have less parasitics on the interconnects and contacts. So here in this tabular format, you will see what are the suitable. So we explored various metals between the carbon nanotube and the metals, which would to understand what is the contact resistance. And you can also calculate it for end contact and side contact. You will see that for metallic, and copper, palladium, nickel, or tungsten, you can see that the contact resistance are somewhat less with respect to if it's a semiconducting and copper. 
that is sort of expected because the interface between a, met a metal and a semiconducting material we would have a larger a larger contact resistance because it's a metal and semiconducting and that's why the doping here plays an important you can see here so from 22 it goes to 8.47 kilo ohms so this is an important in a reduction in the contact resistance so that's how we found out that dopants could be an important feature to include not only for the cnt line improvement but also the contact improvement so now let's go to back to the benchmark so i hope by now i have covered a little bit what are the 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 challenges from the carbon nanotube field effect but also interconnects and also some of the features but now using it into a benchmark. So here it shows the EDP, so the energy delay product, with respect to the carbon nanotube spacing. So as I mentioned now, we are trying to do a design technology co-optimization. So one knob that we were trying to understand is how many carbon nanotubes should be inside the device channel, so the spacing between them. So if I put them closer or further apart, it will also impact the number of carbon nanotubes and also the device performance. And you can see here that as the tube to tube spacing increases, the EDP also increases. And we have done this for device widths of one micron, as shown here in black, or device width of 500 nanometer, and in green and in red are for device uh, widths of 100 nanometer and 200 nanometer. So this is at a device only. Now look what happens if we introduce now the carbon nanotube interconnects. If we introduce the carbon nanotube interconnects, we see that the EDP, so you can see now the, the level, the order of magnitude difference, the before and after. And this also shows that there is a lot of room so that we need to look into interconnects carefully because this is where we start to have a problem in terms of the energy or overall energy efficiency. So now let's look into what happens if we were to use the doped multi-wall CNT interconnects. As we can see here, so these are the EDP again for carbon nanotube fed with doped CNTs. We can see that we can recover a little bit this increase in the energy thanks to the doping. However, also tube to tube spacing, it's another knob that helps us. So we can find, for example, some suites, some uh, minima where we can, uh, can trade off between the, the device width, the tube to tube spacing, and also doping. So these are three potential design parameters that can be explored to have a more energy efficient design. Now on the seven nanometer, so we were to do this optimization on the seven nanometer devices and copper interconnect. So we used what is available for academic purposes. So the design library, the seven nanometer FinFET PDK, which you can get it from Arizona State. So the link is given here. And these are the device parameters that we use. With respect to the interconnect, we use the PTM models, but also these are the back end of line interconnect parasitics and sheet resistance that we use. And you can also obtain this from the Arizona states of the PTM model. So we are starting with this uh, default device and interconnect models, but we are also using as the the tuning parameter so to perform design technology optimization the number of fins so we can see here so with advanced cmos technology the larger copper aspect ratios improve the overall edp so you can see here in blue orange and gray you can see for the various aspect ratios of copper of course an aspect ratio of 10 that means very thin copper lines which might be not necessarily achievable from the processing point of view but to simply show you the trend that it can improve delay also power and overall edp and the number of fins so you can see here starting with three fins five to ten fins that also improves the performance, but there is an overhead in terms of the power and dissipation. So there is a trade-off between the number of fins and the copper aspect ratios. So how can we now compare these two benchmarks? So the carbon nanotube devices with carbon nanotube interconnects and the CNT and the fin fed uh, with copper lines. 
So the basis of comparison is to have the same type of device width. So the device width for CNT FETs was chosen to be 230 nanometer. Why? Because it has to correspond to the same device width with respect to the three uh, FinFET device. So if you were to compute the, the width of the three uh, trigate FinFET, is to also 230 nanometer. So we size the carbon nanotube device to be the same size in order to be able to have some comparable uh, between them. So to have a one-to-one -one comparison. And here we are comparing delay and power with respect to the tube-to-tube -tube spacing. So let's first look into the delay. So the delay of the CMOS with fin fats with three fins and aspect ratio five is this dotted line. So it's a flat line because here it is on the CMOS. What we are seeing with uh, CNTs, we can see this black dotted line. Uh, I, I hope you can see my, my mouse, my black, uh, the black dotted line here, which shows that the, there are is for if we want to have the same performance between the two benchmark, this uh, tube to tube, so the carbon nanotube to carbon nanotube spacing has to be chosen about 23 nanometer and also with doped interconnects in order to have the same performance as the CMOS benchmark. But from the power side, so to have the same performance, which are the curves in blue, you can see where they meet in this region highlighted here. We need about 20 nanometer spacing between the tubes in order to be able to have this ISO power the, where they all match in terms of uh, power, but also performance. Now here on this next slide, you can see if we were to compare the energy delay products of these two benchmarks, it's important to note that we have in, in the black lines, here you can see that we have computed the EVP for the CMOS, uh, so the FinFET with copper, uh, various copper aspect ratios. So from the top, you can see aspect ratio of three, and then the other next black line is the aspect ratio of five, all the way with the lowest EDP. It's with the copper interconnects with very large aspect ratio of 10. And in the blue and red, we show the EDP for the carbon nanotube circuit. So the uh, CNT FET with pristine in blue and CNT FET with dope CNT interconnects. We can see that there is two regions highlighted there as A and B we can see that there are two cross points where the energy delay product of carbon nanotube based benchmark is better than that of the fin fats. And for that, it requires two different type of aspect ratios. So in aspect ratio of five with copper comparable, it's the cross point A. And if we want to compare with EDPs of very aggressive scaled copper aspect ratio of 10 would be the cross point B. What this indicates, indicates as what would be the suitable carbon, nano, uh, carbon nanotube spacing, but also the width of the devices. So what would be the parameters on the carbon nanotube devices and interconnects to be able to match, but even go beyond the EDP of the CMOS benchmark. So these are very important um, uh, uh, pointers for us to go further as we do this design technology co-optimization. And if you're interested to read more about this, this work is published in the IEDM uh, conference. So the, the list of references was further up on the slide, but will also be in the end of the presentation. So if you're interested to know a little bit more. We have also looked into benchmarking, not only ring oscillators, but also larger benchmarks. So here is a float point unit. So we also have developed the design flow. So if you are interested, I would point you out to the work of my postdoc, which has appeared last year at the transaction in electron devices, where we are looking into the CNT FET with C interconnects to have um, the schematic and simulation, but also this comparison in terms of edit um, advantage in power and performance for a flow point unit type of um, um, design. Other thing we're also considering the investigation is to look into the CNT SRAM, so also from the memory application. And if you're also interested, this will come out soon, uh, another pa uh, journal paper that you can look a little bit more, how we are leveraging carbon nanotubes for memory application. As I mentioned, I would like to point you out to the NanoHub repositories because that's where you'll have access to a lot of the models that we have done 
in our work, which are also validated and correlated with the electrical characterization that we have done on carbon nanotubes. So I think that can be a good start for you guys. And also I'd like to point out a, a book that we have um, put together several years ago with other colleagues, which is more into the carbon nanotube interconnects. So I'd like to conclude there to say that there is a need for technology and system level co-optimization for power performance and energy, especially if we want to optimize the device and also optimize the interconnect. So we cannot look at them as two separate. Actually, we need to have this combined overflow of the device and interconnect in order to go beyond what would be with the CMOS devices in order to further leverage the uh, advantages and the improvement with carbon nanotube technology. So this would require also some insights in terms of the what would be the uh, uh, as I mentioned, the features from the processing, because a lot of the characterization data that is coming, that we are, have done so far, is coming from somewhat defective because they are at the very uh, ultra, I mean, the, the temperature growth, as I mentioned, of carbon nanotubes is not very high. So there's a lot of defects due to the low temperature CVD growth of carbon nanotubes. So that also limits somewhat the advantage. But we need to look further so to have this overall design and system level co-optimization for carbon nanotubes. And also we need more into the global interconnects. Uh, what would be, uh, so if we were to scale, what would be some of the uh, design and also um, design space exploration to get us into more CNT aware design flow. Similarly, what we have done for CMOS, so we have a physical design flow with um, CMOS libraries. Now we need to also do similarly for a carbon nanotube based device and interconnect. So with that, I would like to conclude. There is a lot of people that I would like to thank that have been evolved because this is not, I'm not the only person working on this. There have been various students, PhDs, postdocs, colleagues. Here is a few projects that you can look up into our, into our website if you want to know more about what we are also doing beyond carbon nanotubes, but also in neuromorphic or in quantum. And uh, you will you will find out a lot about our work on carbon nanotubes in the Connect project with, with various with uh, various colleagues from European level collaboration. So I would like to point you out there. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them now. Thank you. Thank you, Ida, for this very nice talk, very motivational talk. Uh, I have some questions for you. Uh, the first one that you, you showed uh, uh, two G transistors uh, with MBOS2. Uh, but do you, do you think there, there is room for graphene? Graphene, it's very difficult to be used as semiconductor, but can be a very nice uh, solution for interconnection, for metallic connection. Uh, so graphene, um, there are some uh, papers in IDM last year, especially from uh, Stanford group, where they're using graphene as the barrier line, right? So the, as this um, barrier line around the, the copper. So there are people using it not necessarily as the uh, core metal fill, but for a liner. Uh, with respect to graphene as a device, not necessarily. So I think graphene has other properties that people are are exploiting it for other types like in batteries or in other type of um, applications, not necessary for nanoelectronic field effect, but 2D materials such as transition metal decalvinides like MOS2, WSC2, other families of 2D TMDs are suitable for, for as the new generation going beyond CMOS transistors. And there is a lot of interest at the moment because we are looking for energy efficient solutions. And the problem has to be, as I mentioned, has to be looked at from all the levels, from the device, from the interconnect, from how we architect the system, and also the application, because a lot of this has to be application-oriented solutions. Especially now we are going to AI, neuromorphic, so the architecture matters. So a lot of the decisions, you cannot take them apart anymore. So it has to be uh, holistic optimization from the device material all the way to the architecture style. OK, thanks. Uh, we have a question for, from Luis Eduardo Bolivar. 
Uh, how are the effects of temperature in the connection and the structures of the carbon in the tubes? Uh, excuse me, say that again, how is what? Yeah. what? What's the effects of temperature in the connections and in the structures of the carbon nanotubes? Okay, so yeah, the temperature has a lot to play with the quality of the carbon nanotubes. As I mentioned, if we want to have very high quality, so defect-free carbon nanotubes, we have to grow them at very high temperature or even arc place. So it's another growth technique. We have chosen CVD because that's the most sort of closer to the CMOS. If we were to make this a CMOS friendly process, so we want to put them in the fabrication line and you want to make them applicable so people can start to adopt them in their semiconducting process line, we have to grow them at 450 Celsius, which is um, very limiting, but also that means we have a lot of defects. We don't grow very high quality CNTs. And this is why doping has been our mechanism to kind of overcome these challenges. But temperature plays a big role on the quality of the CNTs. So unless if we find some other way to have high quality growth, um, that, that would be a limiting factor. So that's a very good point. Okay, thank you again. Another question from William Fantinel. Uh, you would like to know, uh, I'd like to know if there, there is, uh, it was produced in carbon nanotube fat, real component, and what is the difficult currently to produce these components? Um, so very good point. I would like to um, uh, maybe highlight that there has been a breakthrough in terms of CNT FETs and also VLSI design with CNT FETs from the colleagues at Stanford uh, and also at MIT. So I would um, point out to some of their recent works in Nature, but also in TD, where they really have shown that they can have, even though it's a simple uh, RISC processor, but a microprocessor, and even in 3D with reRAMs, they have been able to implement a very large scale number of CNT fed devices. And it's impressive what they have been able to accomplish. And this was, um, I think last year, uh, it was one of the major breakthroughs coming from, um, uh, from MIT. So I would like to point out there, there, there are some, even though it's, it's a challenging in terms of fabrication, but this, was, this is why it made a very important contribution to the community. We are working on this over a decade, so building large-scale system remains a challenge. Yeah. Well, a question from Ricardo Jacobi. An estimation of how long would it take to carbon nanotube to be a commercial alternative to silicon chips? Uh, we've been asking this question for some time now, right? Unless if there is some adoption from big um, semiconducting companies, I think it would be difficult. I mean, there, there is a lot of work in academia, research laboratories, but to take it from lab to market or lab to fab, there is uh, there's still you know a lot of gap there going on. We need to mature further. I, this is why it made it so important what MIT was able to show in terms to have this processor based on CNT uh, devices, but still we are, you know, there is still a step further to go from a lab to market. So maybe uh, it's difficult to project in years, but knowing that we've been working already on CNTs for over a decade now and uh, the hype, uh, maybe we are a little bit over that hype curve, but still we need to see some more investment or more interest from a semiconducting industry to be able to mature further what we have been doing in the lab. So there's still a gap. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, you showed in your presentation that this carbon nanotube device can be very good for sensor uh, yeah. device. Do you think that it could be put together in the same device the sensors and the logic and the interconnection in order to create new IoT solutions? Uh, very good point. I think there is a need. So in terms of uh, there is a need to have this, so for example, sensors with the logic to process and to be able to make some decisions, for example, for embedded or for deployable IoT devices. Uh, it remains to be, so there, I, I don't know of any product out there or any prototype that are people uh, trying to 
to leverage this only on CNT based solution. So this is something that we have ex we are currently exploring in the context of smart vista, as I mentioned earlier, to have a system with CNT sensors and be able to have some real time computation or decision making. But we are still far from um, a little bit, you know, a real prototype that we can deploy out there. But th we are leveraging at least we are exploring right now. What is the advantage? What are the challenges? What are the challenges that we have to overcome in terms of process, in terms of also how this overall system has to look like? So this is a timely question. And if there are people interested in postdocs out there listening, please get in touch. These are some very interesting topics that we are currently exploring. Okay, Aida, thanks again. Thank it's you. Thank you for having me.